without further ado, Stephen Sclaru. <laughs> I feel so tall up here. Pretty amazing. Um, the laptop is okay. Great. Uh, in case this wasn't obvious, uh, the kid up there on the desk back in the early 80s is me. And I actually had hair back then. It was pretty, pretty awesome. My father was a serial tech entrepreneur, and I remember growing up seeing him pecking on his keyboard every day and pretty much every couple months being laid out in bed with a bad back. I decided I didn't want to have any of that. I wanted to be outdoors, hiking, fly fishing, camping. So I decided to pursue a career in biology. Specifically, I wanted to be a biology professor. So I went to Virginia Tech, focused on a bachelor's degree in biology, and about three years into the program, on a whim, I took a class on entomology. Now, how many people know what entomology is? Wow, that's pretty impressive. Okay, well, I had no idea what I was getting into, I, and I had no interest in bugs at that point in my life. In fact, I have to admit, I was a bit of a bug murderer. Uh, in any case, <laughs> uh, I took that class in entomology, and it completely floored me. I didn't realize how diverse insects were. I didn't realize how much they had an impact on our planet. So the next semester, I took a class in aquatic entomology. And for those of you that are interested in fly fishing, there's a real connection between aquatic entomology and fly fishing. And so I completely fell in love with aquatic entomology. And before I knew it, I was graduating from Virginia Tech, and I had to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. So I uh, enrolled in a graduate degree program focused on river ecology and restoration. Now, that program was pretty rigorous. Um, it was kind of a small group of people working primarily in the fishery side, and I was kind of the one guy interested in aquatic entomology. And so I spent a lot of time doing research uh, with various uh, organizations throughout the state, and ultimately I had to decide upon a master's degree research project. Now, at this point in my life, again, I like to spend time outside. Uh, I wanted to do something that you know, had meaning. I wanted to do something that was pretty rigorous. So I chose to study the colonization of wood in 15 different rivers in Virginia. Three in the coastal area, three in the Piedmont, and three in the mountains. And so in each one of those rivers, I had to mount 15 logs and make sure that they wouldn't move throughout the year. Now, I didn't really realize how hard that was, but when you consider flooding and droughts and things like that, it was incredibly difficult. Uh, and on top of that, I had to go and sample each one of those logs every season. And sampling basically required me going to a post, pulling a log off the post, and then somehow getting all the organisms from the log into a bag and then bringing it back and doing identification work. Now, <clears throat> in the mid-90s, in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains alone, I was sampling a log, and as I picked it up, I felt a lightning bolt shoot up from my toes to my lower back. I was shocked. I was in incredible pain. As I mentioned, I was alone. I was very scared. So I crawled out of the river somehow, got into my manual stick shift, manual transmission Honda Civic, and I drove for two hours crying all the way to my apartment in Richmond, Virginia. That was the biggest inflection point in my life. And from that point forward, I was basically stuck in bed for six months. And a couple days later, my parents came down. And my dad, being the serial tech entrepreneur, was like, hey, I've got a present for you. Here's a desktop computer and a book called Building Cool Websites. <laughs> and he said, you might as well do something productive while you're stuck in bed. So I spent the next six months building websites in bed. The first website I built was uh, vaflyfish.com. So it was my passion project, right? I would learned all about aquatic entomology, and I loved fly fishing. And so I built this website, and very soon after, started getting thousands of users on this website. And this is like 1996, right? Before all the cool social media stuff. And um, you know, all these people were coming on my websites. I, uh, was able to see people you know, posting fishing reports, 
people swapping flies, learning new techniques, and it was invigorating. Soon after that, I got a contract working for the Chesapeake Bay program, and I built online maps so that people could know kind of where the parks and recreation were around the Chesapeake Bay. Then I picked up a contract building a website for my friend's uh, financial services company. He convinced his boss that I should build their first website. It was just amazing. Again, 1996. After all those experiences, somehow I got an opportunity to apply for a job at Ernst & Young. They had started a new Center for Technology Enablement, which was basically their way of building a small group that would bring internet technologies to large companies. And with a pretty lame portfolio and no background in computer science, they hired me somehow. Um, and I spent the next three years learning everything I could about computer science. I remember flying back and forth across the country with a Java in the nutshell book, reading it over and over again, trying to understand Java. In any case, for the next couple of years, you know, in that consulting role, I was traveling a lot. I think I mentioned to some of you that, you know, I literally spent one day at home uh, a week, and um, my girlfriend at the time gave me the ultimatum, basically said, hey, if you don't stop traveling, this relationship is not going any further. So I stopped traveling, I got married, uh, I married into a family of healthcare practitioners. In fact, my wife's parents were both psychiatrists. So imagine like the process <laughs> of being okay, you know, to marry. Um, but that led me to move to Oregon. Um, after a couple years further in that marriage up in Northern Virginia, working long hours, we were like, we need to get out of the rat race. We need to move to Oregon. So I was in Oregon for a couple of years, working for a couple companies up in Portland, and I kind of hit a wall in my career. I was working for a startup, it wasn't really working out, and there wasn't a lot of jobs in Portland. Unfortunately, like all the jobs for tech are kind of in Seattle or San Francisco. And so on, on a whim, I just started calling up some old friends. I'd worked in a number of startups and, and big companies, and before I knew it, I was making some money on the side while still working at the startup. And along the way, I ran into a machine learning project, and I had started a company and hired a chief data scientist, and I asked him, hey, would you like to work with me on this machine learning project? And before I knew it, you know, we were picking up more and more business. We started calling ourselves Synaptic, and you know, I became the CEO of Synaptic and focused on that from that point forward. So that's in 2015. And so Synaptic is a company I've run. We've been working um, in many different industries. Um, we've done about 100 project, sorry, 100 clients and about 250 projects, and it's all around AI. And so it's been fascinating over the last day listening to all of you and, and your thoughts around AI. But what I wanted to share with you is some practical applications. But before I get into that, I just wanted to mention that one of the things that became very obvious to me as I got into this field was there was a lot of fear around AI and how it would replace jobs. And I was not interested in being a part of that, honestly. And so what we focused on as a company is really this idea that AI can give humans superpowers. We're not looking to replace humans. We're looking to give humans superpowers. And so I had um, spent a lot of time in the healthcare industry building AI applications there at Synaptic. And one of the terms that came up in that space was this collaborative intelligence. And so we've started using that in a lot of our marketing material, but truly, like, we really focus on the people side of this. So with that backstory in mind, I want to talk to you about two really exciting projects we worked on, real-world applications of AI. Um, one's going to be in the, the area of coral restoration, and I didn't really realize that this stage would have coral on it. Uh, <laughs> so that's been super cool. Uh, and the other one's around disease surveillance. So, I'm sure all of you know that our reefs around the world are collapsing, right? Due to climate change, due to overfishing, and due to other environmental factors. We met a company called Coral Vita years ago. In fact, our sales guy uh, uh, roomed with the CEO of Coral Vita in college. And so we were aware of what they were doing, and we had a conversation with them several years ago. And they were focused on restoring coral reefs in the Bahamas. They had built, actually, this exact farm in the Bahamas. And as you can see, you know, there's multiple tanks. In each one of those tanks, there's coral. Um, and their goal was to really kind of replenish, refresh, restore the coral reefs in the Bahama area and then expand out to the Caribbean. Along the way, um, 
the UK announced the Earthshot Prize. How many folks are familiar with the Earthshot Prize? Yep, okay, a few of you. Uh, basically, they wanted to fund companies that were doing things that were positive for the world, particularly in the area of climate and conservation. And Coral, Re Coral Vita applied for uh, a prize and actually won, uh, which was amazing. And from that, they were awarded a million pounds. And the CEO is like, hey, I need to figure out a way to scale this business. And so he hired our company, and we set out to build that collaborative intelligence. Now, before I get into the details of how this worked, has anybody worked on a coral reef farm? OK, didn't think so. All right, so simple, simple example of how things work there. Uh, they take a big piece of coral, cut it up into little fragments. They put the little fragments on plugs. Then they stick plugs in racks. Then they stick racks in aquariums. Very labor intensive. Now, where it gets difficult is that once you have all these racks, I'm going to go back for a second, and all these aquariums, now you have to monitor them, right? So these little tiny pieces of coral sitting on a, a little plug that you can see right here on the right. And a human being has to look at each one of those pieces of coral and determine whether they need to be cleaned. So in their particular farm, they had hundreds of fragments of coral, and every day they'd have to kind of monitor this coral. So the first thing that we set out to do was help automate that process. Um, while it sounds amazing to live in the Bahamas and work on a coral reef farm, the reality is these are very remote. And it's very difficult to get people to want to do this type of work. Um, and so what we did is we ended up building a rig that sits on top of each of the tanks. And on that rig is a high-end camera, a pH sensor, a salinity sensor, a temperature sensor, et cetera. And we tied all that stuff up into the cloud and started moving that data up into the cloud. Now, for those of you that have been involved in machine learning or artificial intelligence, um, you're probably aware that either you can do things without labeling and you can do things with labeling. Well, in this case, it was very important to label all the images that were moving up into the cloud so that, so that we can build an engine that would inference um, what those images meant. Um, so the first stage of this was having people in the farm actually label images of coral fragments. Were they healthy? Were they not healthy? Things like that. Um, after a while, we were able to train models that would then do that for them. So throughout the day, as these cameras are running, it would say, hey, these, these particular fragments are healthy, these aren't healthy. And it would direct the operational staff to the, to the pieces of coral that they needed to focus on that day. And then as the system continued running, we would continue feeding those images back to humans, and those humans would look at the labels that the machines came up with and say, yep, that works, nope, that doesn't, and they changed the labels. So that human-machine collaboration was really critical to make this work. And now, as of about a year ago, that is how they're running their coral restoration farm. They've got all this technology, all these people working together to help improve not only the operations of the farm, but the speed at which they can replace coral back into the reefs. Now, what was really cool about this is they realized once they were able to get this kind of human-machine collaboration going, that there was a global opportunity for this platform. And in fact, um, the Saudi Arabian government was looking to build a massive coral reef farm, and were looking for companies to design, build, and operate that farm. So Coral Vita applied for that and won it. And at this point, they are in the process of building out thousands of tanks with dozens of racks in each tank with you know, hundreds of coral fragments in each rack. So it's been incredible to kind of see this whole thing through. They did not start with a plan of using technology. They had money, they did some experimentation, and by the end of it, they've got a global platform that can help other coral reef farms throughout the world save the reefs. Now, I didn't tell you this earlier, but before I became a, an aquatic entomologist, I wanted to be a marine biologist, so this was a dream come true. In any case, um, the last thing my grandfather said to me before he passed away was, your health is your wealth. And it didn't really sink in for me until my midlife, when I had a number of friends and family that had chronic illness, mental health issues, and some of them passed. But in March 11th, 2020, the world changed for me. 
like I didn't know what was going on. The World Health Organization labeled COVID-19 a pandemic. And as a father and a business owner and a tech nerd, I had immediate questions, right? Where is this vi virus circulating? How can I keep my family and friends safe and healthy? What was the risk of going outside? And what was this gonna do to my business? I really had no idea. And what I realized shortly thereafter was that the disease surveillance systems that we have throughout the United States were broken. In fact, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention decided to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to fix these systems, to basically modernize these systems. They had problems like fragmented data. Data from uh, reports were coming in late. They were underfunded, they were antiquated. They just simply weren't set up for the surge of COVID-19. And I didn't realize this, but while all of us were trying to understand what was going on, the state, the state governments were hiring people off the street to man these systems, and their user experiences were terrible. Like, no one could figure out how to use them. Um, so we had an opportunity with a partner to respond to an RFP to modernize the disease surveillance system for the state of Michigan. We weren't a government contractor, and we certainly weren't interested in taking an old system taking those requirements and just applying new technology and calling that a modernized system. So we pitched the idea that we were gonna take a data first and user first approach, and we won the contract. Now, <clears throat> how many of you are familiar with what an epidemiologist does? Wow, that's pretty good, okay, I had no clue. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I learned right off the bat was they're like detectives. Um, they get information from everywhere. They have to collect information, connect information, interpret information, and from all of that, they need to make informed public health decisions on behalf of all of us. Now, imagine trying to do that with systems that are antiquated, broken, duplicative data. I mean, it's just crazy. So, this all happened about two years ago, and I had been working at Synaptic for six, seven years, and one of the things that just hit me, struck me, another lightning bolt, was that public health is ripe for AI. And really what makes AI work is data. And we haven't talked about that enough in this conference, but it's all about data. And so as CEO of Synaptic, I had spent a lot of time with executives in small and large companies plotting out their strategy for AI. And it hit me that like, if these epidemiologists kind of have the backbone for data, then they can do amazing things. They can get those superpowers that we talked about earlier. So we applied a lot of this kind of strategy type stuff into the state of Michigan. And where we are today is we've um, not only built out a new system for them that um, uses a data lake, a powerful search engine, and geographical dashboards so they know where things are happening. But ultimately, they've, they've switched from using their legacy system to surface critical data to our system that we've built kind of on the side of it at this point. Now, where we want to go, now that we have all the data in one place, is really start implementing machine learning training models to help them be even more effective. So they get a lot of documents and they have to read all the documents and try to extract out the relevant information. So using AI to kind of crack open those documents and pull out text and images. Using AI to predict outbreaks, right? A lot of what they need to do is kind of take all this data and figure out whether there's a problem they need to address. Using AI to recommend how to merge data. And then using AI to summarize, extract, and translate text. So that's where we're going. And for those of you who have worked in government contracting, you probably know that at each stage you have to get awarded, right? So we're in the process of hoping we get the next award, but at this point, that data system and the critical data now being accessible to epidemiologists and public health staff in the state of Michigan is, is in, intact. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things I wanted to share as I wrap up here is there's a lot of different ways to get into AI. I know we've been kind of talking about 
the Uber AI, kind of this generative AI or general AI, but there's a lot of pra practical applications of it, and it doesn't have to be this scary thing. It's really just having a data set and a use case. So I would encourage everybody to think about different ways to get involved, be it thinking about your data or AI strategy, playing with generative AI and seeing if you can get you and your staff to kind of use it in their day-to-day -day workflow, taking data sets and use cases and training up models and see if they can help you, and even using off-the-shelf AI models for your day-to-day -day, day -day environment. I've been really fortunate to start off in a career in biology, go off to tech, and then come back to biology. Really enjoyed it, and it really invigorates me. A lot of the work that we do is with businesses, and we think about how the work we do with businesses ladders up into helping the people and helping planet. Now, as we move forward, there's a tremendous number of problems that we're faced with in a day-to-day -day world. And I would encourage everybody to not be scared by it, but to look at it as a, a potential and to see the applications of AI around you. There are small applications, large applications, and the time is really now. Thank you.